He's an international renowned lecturer and educator and has spoken extensively around the world, including the United States, Europe, South Africa, Canada, and Israel, on topics of hashkafa, learning methodology, and shmir salashan, that's proper speech, with emphasis on the writings of Ramosha Chaim Lozato, known as the Ramchal. Rabbi Kessin rece received smicha from Ramosha Feinstein Zatzal and held a close relationship with Chaim Friedlander Zatzal and helped with the publication of the Sifre HaRamchal, the Green Collection. He is a PhD in psychology from Fordham University in New York and runs a private practice in Brooklyn and Lakewood. He lives in Israel part-time. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by Operation Home Again. The mission of Operation Home Again is to be a catalyst and facilitator of synagogue and community-based Aliyah for North America as part of an inspiring, of, as part of inspiring a movement of returning home. By the way, the website is Operation Home Again, one word, dot com. The founder of this organization is in our presence tonight, Rabbi Shimon Appersdorf, who together with his dynamic team is building the premier organization devoted exclusively to community-based Aliyah from North America. At this historic junction of unfolding opportunity for the last major diaspora community to return home. Operation Home Again is poised to catalyze, to catalyze and facilitate the entire process. I have a quote from Rabbi Yitzhak Berkowitz, the Roshiva of Torah. What, were, what, what would our ancestors not have done to come live in Eretz Israel? Today it is doable. Operation Home Again seems to be the most realistic approach to enabling our brethren to come home, and it's worthy of our support in every way. And without any further ado, Rabbi Kessin. I've titled uh, this year, which I'm going to give tonight, <clears throat> The Meaning of an Insane World uh, at the End of Time. I think everybody agrees the world has turned insane. Uh, without going into all the protum, all the details, because what we're seeing in the world has never really happened before, which I will point out. <clears throat> and so on, you know. Um, it's almost like the world has left civilized behavior. I mean, we take a look at what's going on, you know, and I will we'll talk about that. Uh, we're no longer looking at a normal civilized world, whether it be murder or crime. On uh, the United States, it's horrendous, you know, and uh, <clears throat> there it's a thrill. We have a tremendous amount of insanities, irrationalities. It's hard to believe that civilization is ending the way it is that way. So the question we have to ask as Jews, what does the Torah have to say about all this? <clears throat> Why is God doing this? I mean, like I, like I say, look, the world has always been basically touched by insanity anyway, you know? That's the, that's the nature of the world. But today when you look at people, especially in America, transgender and, and you have to be careful of your pronouns, right? Uh, they're destroying the education system, the abortions. I mean, it's just beyond belief what's going on there <clears throat> and so on. So we have to ask, why is the Rabbi Shalom doing this? What's the meaning of it? Because when you think about it, it's almost as if the Rabbi Shalom has abandoned civilization. Let me take a look at China, 1.4 billion people. That's a lot of people, you know. And um, it's basically a police state, terrible police state and so on, you know. Uh, then you look at other countries and so on. 
the world, like I don't want to belabor the point, but clearly it's pervaded with insanities, things that make no sense. Not that civilization always made sense. You know, a lot of it is crazy, <clears throat> you know. But uh, now it's not, it's not because there are wars, it's just the uh, lifestyles that people have chosen, you know, run contrary to logic, what should be uh, the normal type of, you know, uh, civilizations. So that's the question. Well, in order to find that out, it's not easy, you see, even though actually it's been predicted in the Gemara, Saita, Sanhedrin, that before the Mashiach comes, things are going to get really crazy, really desperate, negative, and crazy. Why? Why does it have to happen that way? That's the question I want to answer. And I'm going to bring down, <clears throat> basically, um, the understanding of that. What does the Russian want to achieve? And you will see the outcome of this is that if the world did not go crazy or if the world did not act in this irrational manner, the Jews could not be saved. And that's a mystery. But you'll understand why the Bershom has to do this. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's not only uh, in terms of what was, but also in a, in a certain sense what will be. I'll try to be comprehensive tonight and really try to offer, you know, really uh, rational, valid explanations. <clears throat> so the first question is, what is the anhoga, the actions of God, before the Mashiach comes? Like I said, we see what it is, because it's insane, it's irrational. And like I said, I'm going to try to answer that. <clears throat> Where is the answer to this question? And the answer is, in the last test of Avram Avinu. It's called the Akedah, you see. And there are many strange things about the Akedah. What happened and why. Uh, we know what the story is, obviously, where the Bershom appears to Avram Avinu and says to him, you know, I want you to offer up Yitzchak. And I want you to, he didn't say that, but obviously it was interpreted. I want you to kill him, offer him up as a oilo, as a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. That's what the Bansham said to Avraham Avinu. Now, <clears throat> as such, we can distinguish seven different nisiones, not one, seven. Because every single aspect of this, if you really think about that, is really insane. Not because why is Rosham asking for this, because it doesn't even make sense. Klape, which means according to the Rosham, or mankind. Let's take a look. <clears throat> and ultimately you will see is that the answer to the Akeda is the secret of what has to be. It's interesting. <clears throat> and, uh, and we will see what, the, the answer and so on, you know, from the story of the Akeda. <clears throat> now, what was the test of Avram? I mean, he gets up in the morning to do the job, to kill his son, basically, you know, and so on. <clears throat> and the truth is, when he received the commandment to do this, he had to be thinking about seven different things. Each one is gut-wrenching. Every single thought or aspect of what he was commanded to do has to be gut-wrenching. What are they? Okay, the first idea is Avraham Avinu's chief characteristic, which we know from the Gemara, from the, Chazid, the Torah itself, was chesed, kindness. Uh, you know, I mean, his, his kindness was legendary. What person, after being, you know, circumcised and therefore he's in the guy, I mean, he's 99 years old or whatever, can imagine the pain he was under. Meanwhile, he's sitting there waiting for guests. You know, who does that, you know, <clears throat> and so on, you know? Uh, so that itself is incredible. Avraham Avinu is the chief architect of Chesed. That's what he was. And therefore that has a lot of Kabbalistic implications and so on. See, can you imagine uh, that 
he, the, the, the Bansham tells Avram Avinu, who's this incredible Baal Chesed, what is Chesed? To benefit, to be kind to somebody else, to help them. That's Chesed, you know, however you want to translate it and so on. But it indicates a tremendous amount of love, right? And kindness to others. Here's a person who has those meters, right? And all of a sudden, he's asked to kill somebody. Kill somebody? That's the worst thing you can do to a person, you see? So uh, we're looking at something where the Bansham commanded him to violate his own nature. Very hard to do. So that's the first decision. What? How can I do that? You know? So that's the first kind of decision of Avram Avinu. Then we have, wait a minute, as great as Avram Avinu is of Chesed, God is a bigger Baal Chesed, right? Chesed, the Bansham is the quintessence, the essence of Chesed. So why would the Bansham do that? We're not looking here at somebody who deserved to die, right? The Bansham is the greatest of all Chesed. In fact, that's what it says. Oilum Chesed Yibona. The world was created, right, through Chesed. Uh, in, in other words, it's almost like more than we want to exist, the Bansham wants us to exist so he can give us benefit. That's Chesed of the Bansham. So the Bansham is the greatest Baal Chesed. So how in the world can somebody who that, has that kind of love, right, <clears throat> How can a person like that want to kill Yitzchak? Doesn't make sense. It's the exact opposite of the meter of the, of the Rabbani Shalom, right? The okay, characteristics, think about that. So this is a theological, right, uh, a paradox in that sense, right? That Abraham would say, I don't understand, how can God command that? His meter, his characteristic, is the exact opposite. So it's impossible if you think about that. That's the second kind of Nisan that Avraham Avinu had. <clears throat> the third one is, wait a minute, the Bansha we know is Shafi Kolaretz. He's the ultimate judge. Whatever he decrees is absolute justice, whether we understand the justice or not, doesn't make a difference. Uh, can, all of it can be readily affirmed exactly why it's just. Because that's what the Bansha says. He says that Nazinu, right? Sadik Vyosha, Einovel. There's no Avlo in the Rabbani Shalom. There's not one thing which, when you think about it, is remarkable. Because imagine a person standing in front of the Rabbani Shalom after 120 years, right? He's standing in front of the Rabbani Shalom, right? And the Rabbani Shalom says, well, before I pronounce judgment, what would you like to ask? Well, you know, I was standing at a corner, and I had my car parked, right? And I reached in to put a quarter in the meter, right? They came out with a dime. Why did you do that? Yes, <clears throat> that's how far... You can ask the Bansham to defend his behavior because it has to be just. If you didn't deserve to come out with a different coin, it could never happen to you. We don't realize the infinite limits that the Bansham goes through to be justified, to justify himself to you. So the question is, Yitzchak doesn't deserve to die. That makes sense. Uh, so why should he die? You know, you want to test Avram Avinu, fine. But why does it have to be on Yitzchak's cheshben? As they say, he's got to die because you want to give him a test. So to, to tell him to commit suicide or whatever you want to do, right? But what's up to do with Yitzchak? If you think about that, uh, you see. Okay, anyway, that's the third Nisayim. All right. <clears throat> Not only that, how do you kill a person? You know, we, Avram Avinu understood the value of human life. We don't realize what human life is. I mean, you know, the, 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 one of the problems of this civilization is life is cheap. That's what it is. I mean, just take a look what's going on in America or Israel. The crime rates are soaring. Israel, Rachmanus, people die all the time. It's incredible. It goes on. We don't realize the value of the chashivas of human life. Well, clearly Avraham Avinu did. So Yitzchak is a human life, right? How... Human life is not sacrificed for God. This isn't part of worshiping God. There's no such thing as human sacrifices. I mean, it was practice, you know, by the Aztecs and all those crazy people and so on, right? They were all butchers. But Jews don't do that. 
And it's the Roshim that's saying, you know, what the value of human life is. How could that be? That's another Nisoyen. Then we call, for, of course, we come to the personal Nisoyenus. It's his son. He's not killing a stranger. This happens to be his son. Imagine a guy being commanded to kill his child. Now, how many parents can do that? It's just absolutely incredible. You see, each one of these thoughts is gut-wrenching, if you think about it. It's not a simple idea. And I'm sure Avram Avinu, with his incredible intellect, is thinking about all of this. Because it's so obvious, you see. <clears throat> not only that, not only is it his son, guess what? He's the last Jew, right? You kill him, there's no more Jews, right? That doesn't make any sense. Why would the bunch of me to kill the last Jew? Because Sorrow was already, what, you know, 90, I mean, uh, Yitzchak himself, no, what am I talking about? It was like 130, 140, whatever, you know? That's it for the kids, you know? Uh, you know, and so on. So he's essentially being commanded to kill the Jewish people, because if there's no Yitzchak, right? It ain't gonna happen, as they say, right? Mm. So that's clearly an Nisoyen, right? All of those things, I'm sure, bothered Avraham Avinu terribly. But really, I'll tell you something even interesting, more interesting. I don't believe that Avraham Avinu had a problem with these seven ideas. You know what the real thing that bothered Avraham Avinu? It was a, theolo a theological problem. I don't understand something. The Bereshim gave me a nevuah, a prophecy, right? Ki bi Yitzchak yikor l'chozora. In Yitzchak, right, your descendants will pass. In Yitzchak. Why? Because the Jewish people will emerge from Yitzchak. So if I have to kill him, right, it ain't going to happen. Why? Because Yitzchak is not married. He has no kids, right? So if I kill Yitzchak, that's a complete contradiction to the, the, the Nevoah, the prophecy, right, that the Jewish people will descend from Yitzchak. It's, in fact, it's impossible. It is two completely contradictory prophecies. And that theologically is impossible because the Bereshim doesn't do that. How can the Bereshim say he will give rise to the Jewish people, right? On one side, and then the next side, kill him. It's exactly, which means obviously, dead people don't reproduce, so obviously there won't be any Jewish people. That is probably what bothered him the most because what it was was a uh, a refutation of the rationality of God. And if that's the truth, if that's what happened, then it's a refutation of God himself. Impossible. Uh, and, and since Avraham Avinu was a philosopher, incredible, he knew God at three years old, or whatever he was, 48, whatever, and so on, you know, this probably bothered him the most. It would, it, it would completely eradicate any belief of who God is. The contradiction of prophecy. There you are. I've just rattled off seven or eight different problems that Avraham Avinu had, right? I mean, who could have overcome one of them, let alone all seven or eight, whatever? But Avram did. He got up in the morning. Vayash came Avram Baburka. It's incredible. You know, he didn't sleep late and said, "Well, I got time to kill my son, right? Let him. Let me give him a couple more hours, right?" <clears throat> He got up in the morning, early in the morning, right? Saddled his donkeys, whatever, and he's on the way to kill his son. It's astounding when you think about that. So it's not the, only the fact that, you know, Yitzhak has to die, but it's the different aspects of the concept that Yitzhak has to die. This is what disturbed Avraham Avinu. Yet he did it, you see. Now, we have a question. Why did the Mershom do that? Well, let's understand the nature of this test, right? <clears throat> Many times, by the way, what the Mershom really did wasn't this, because he said, He never told Avraham Avinu to kill him. He just said, bring him off as an offering. That's it. So that's how you escape the whole theological paradox, you see. But Avraham Avinu interpreted the statement correctly. Obviously, if I have to bring him up for an oila, well, it's not to decorate him as beach, it's to kill him. It's the obvious conclusion, you see? 
So Avraham Avinu interpreted the correct interpretation, but you can't say that the Bansham contradicted himself. He didn't. In fact, the Bansham even tells him that, in any case. Uh, so the question, what's the meaning of all this? You see, not only that, why was it the last test? It's the last test. The Akeda is the last great test of Avraham Avinu, and he had 10 different tests, and this was the last, uh, you see. And the number itself is very significant. Truth is, it's a very difficult question to answer. But what was the test, really? What the Bajram did was interesting. He appeared to Avraham Avinu, through this commandment, as an irrational god, a god that makes no sense. Uh, he appeared to Avraham Avinu as a god, <coughs> like I said, that doesn't make sense, he's irrational. You know, he's, uh, well, as in English, I think it's quixotic or whatever, and so on, you know. Um, and that was on purpose. I want Avraham Avinu to look at me and think that I'm, some, I'm off my, my rocker or something like that, right? You know, because how can God do this? Right? And that's the immediate interpretation. There's a complete contradiction. Now we have to ask why. But the nature of the test is to appear irrational to Avraham Avinu. And that's clearly what it was. The question is, why would the Rosham do that? Why does he want to appear rational? It's a very powerful question. Normally, if the Rosham wants to put you to a test, so he will do something where you do not know the reason. It's called unknown. But the Rosham never contradicts himself. That's a theological paradox, you see? So it's one thing if he tells you or he does something which could have a reason, but we don't know what the reason is. Okay, but it's not irrational. But to do something that makes no sense, that's an absolute contradiction, is impossible. The doesn't behave that way, doesn't act that way. So that's the question. <clears throat> to look for an answer, we don't have to look any further than Rashi. And Rashi offers a profound understanding of the whole justification of the Akedah. It's an amazing concept, what he says. And in many ways, this is the secret to what is happening today in the world. This is the definition of the last type of behavior that the Rebbe has to the Jewish people at the end of time. And what does Rashi say? So Rashi says where the Rebbe with a Malach actually says to, uh, to Avraham Avinu, Atuyadati, for now I know that you fear God. Uh, so what do you mean now I know? You mean before this you didn't know? Of course the Bansham knows. So what do you mean now? It's like, well now I know I can deal with this information and I have what to do with it. What's that mean? So Rashi says, <clears throat> right? Yesh li lahoshiv. I can now answer, respond. To who? To the Satan and the Umm Sa'ilam. What do you mean respond? Because they are going to launch, right, an accusation against the Jewish people. And they're going to say, we don't understand something, you know. You're a God of justice. What do you want with the Jewish people? They sin. They do all kinds of violations. Why do you love them so much? Why don't you abandon them? They're not listening to you. They're not doing your will. So what's this business here? Why do you adore them so much? What is this, favoritism? Nepotism? What is this? Uh, that's the Satan and the Umm Sa'ilam. That's what the Satan says. Because he's always trying to split God from the Jewish people. And that's his business. You see, why? It's interesting, the psychology of the Satan. Because he knows that the Jews will always be loyal to God. No matter what they do, Goyim, they'll throw them away and finish. If something comes across, right, which is more attractive, they'll ditch God and do that. But Jews are not like that. And where we see that, Am Kishir Uref, where the Bansham says the Jews are stiff necked in many ways. Uh, but they are stiff necked in that way. You see, mm. so Rashi says in the, that what's going to happen is that the Sultan is going to tighten up when the Jews have committed a great deal of sins. Why not abandon them? Just get rid of them. It's over with. 
you know, they violate your laws, change them for another nation. You see? So it's interesting, that's a great claim. And he's right to Sutton, because the Sutton defends justice. That's why he was created to defend justice. So Bansham can't just shoot him and dismiss him. No, he created the Sutton to defend justice, right? He's the great prosecuting attorney. So it's interesting that the Bansham had no answer. He could not justify why he does not want to abandon the Jews. I see. So it's unfortunate. Because who's the only one that gave him the answer? It's the Jew. You see, it's not a matter of logic here. The Rebbe had no answer for justice itself, you see, until the Akedah. So that's what the Rashi says. Now I have what to answer, what the argument against the claim of the Sultan. What is the answer? What is the, what is the answer that the can now? Uh, because this is a very important concept. Uh, there will come a time, and that's why it's the last test, before the Mashiach, when the Jews, right, do not keep the mitzvahs, they sin. There was a study in London, for instance, that estimated there's 15.1 million Jews in the world. How many religious Jews are there? So they estimate there's 2.1 million Jews. What about the other 13 million? They're all gone. They're gone. Simulated, intermarried, unaffiliated, they're gone. Spread throughout the world, you see? So what does that mean? Well, most Jews are gone. We don't realize that. And even in Eretz Israel, most Jews are gone. Yeah, there are Jews that are traditional, right? So they'll eat a, a matzo on Pesach, all right? Okay, that's nice. But right after the matzah, right? They'll do whatever they want. They'll eat chametz and so on. This is the problem. There will come a time when 90% of the Jewish people will be gone, right? And so the Sultan's going to say to them, what do you want them for? Get rid of them. Take somebody else, right? Why? Not because I say it, the Sultan says, because justice demands that you get rid of him and take somebody else. Why? Because they have violated the agreement. That's why. You see, <clears throat> what's the Bansham can answer? The Akeda. Why is the Akeda the answer? What did Avraham Avinu do that answered this? And the answer is what the Akeda really is. And that's why the Bansham appeared to him irrational. Right? Because what would any normal person have done? This doesn't make any sense. Hey, I'm giving up God. It's over with. Finished. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to worship a God that's completely, you know, uh, irrational. But Avraham Avinu didn't do that. What did he do? He said to himself, I have no understanding of what is going on. It doesn't make sense at all. And so on. But one thing I do know, I will not abandon God. I don't care if I don't understand it. I will not because I love the Rabban Shalom. I will not, and deep down, somehow, it has to make sense. That's why. <clears throat> what did Avraham Avinu express? What Avraham Avinu expressed was an unbelievable loyalty to God. In, in the face of irrationality, when anybody else would have abandoned God, he didn't. So this, this is the kicker. So the Basham turns to the Sultan and says, you know, you're right. They violate the laws. Really, justice demands, right, that I abandon them. Give them up for somebody else. But I can't. Because justice demands also that if they will not abandon me on the reasons that make sense, how can I abandon them? Mida keneged mida. You see. <clears throat> this is what the Mansham said. It's true that they're not doing the mitzvahs right and really I should think about it and, and, and switch them for some other people. But justice demands also that if these people, like I said, don't abandon me, even though by right they should, because the way I appear to them, irrational, of course they should. Then how can I abandon them? 
In other words, loyalty to God itself will save the Jewish people. That's right. But in order to have loyalty, God has to appear rational, doesn't he? Because that's the justice. If God appears, you know, okay, they don't know why I'm doing something. Okay, so it makes sense. That's why they don't abandon me. But if the Jews don't abandon the Rebbeim out of a sense of love and loyalty, right? <clears throat> so how could I abandon them? Even if they don't listen and agree to the contract. That's what saves the Jews. That's why the Rebbeim needed a justice argument against the Sultan, because there were big problems, you see. Because the Russian can't just dismiss the Sultan. He has to do this for, the, for, the, for justice sake. What an argument. That's why he had to give uh, this test to Avram Avinu. And that's why he had to appear rational. Because then he can prove to the Sultan and the Umas Ailam, they're all back there with the Sultan screaming, right? <clears throat> that I will not abandon somebody that does not abandon me even though the logical idea is to abandon me. That's justice. And that is absolutely brilliant. If you think about that, to answer justice with justice. And you can only do it until the Akedah. And Rashi says that, that's what he means. Yeishli ma'ala hoshev, I now have something to answer. Because I have to justify it with justice. That's the answer. But the condition is, right, that the Jews will not abandon God, even though God is irrational. That's not good. Because if God appears to us irrational, it's gonna be very hard to figure out what's going on, you know, and so on. That's the concept of the, the, uh, the uh, Akedah, why it's so important. Uh, and we begin to understand at the end of time, when the Jews, in a certain sense, have in, in certain ways abandoned God in the sense that they don't do the mitzvahs. But many Jews have not abandoned God himself. Certainly a segment, right? They keep the mitzvahs. And even those people that don't keep the mitzvahs right, they hold themselves to be Israelis, right? Israel, to them is a, a, a holy country. Or if a guy just has a Pesach Seder, you know, where he says the Agoda Matzah, hey, he abandoned him everywhere else, but he's still with God. Or even circumcision. How many Jews do circumcision even though they are completely fry? You see, that is called loyalty to God. There are many different ways of being loyal to God. You see, so many different ways. And if you look at the Jewish people, so many of them, right, do some type of uh, mitzvah that indicates a loyalty and so on. Very important idea. So that's a very important thing to know. The concept of loyalty is what saves the Jews in the end. That's what does it. You see, <clears throat> and therefore the Bosham has to appear in an irrational way. So and that will be the test. Will they be loyal or not? Very important idea. Uh, and the truth is the Bosham is doing that all the time. He's always many times appearing irrational. You see, <clears throat> let's take a look, you know. It says there, Kiyokim Bekibach Novi. And if uh, in, in Dvorim, and if a false prophet arises, and he says, I'm going to do a miracle, because you have to abandon God and worship other gods, right? And it says that the miracle passes, happens. Wait a minute, that's impossible. Because only God can do miracles, really. How this guy pull it off? You see? So that's irrational. So the Bosham says, why did I do this? Why did I allow this guy to do a miracle? And the Bosham says, to see, not that if you're going to do the mitzvahs or not, by not worshipping idol. He doesn't even say that. He says, because I, if you take a look at Dvorim Pashas Rei, he says, Hayishchem Oyavim, do you love God or not? Doesn't talk about the mitzvahs. Do you love God? to the extent that you're going to be loyal to me. So even though you're looking at something irrational, because how did this guy do a miracle? It has to be that God allowed him to do the miracle. Well, that's a complete contradiction to belief in God. So Bonshima says, I'm going to pull, pull this off. I'm going to pull off this 
complete irrationality, right? To know, do you love me or not? Do you, are you still loyal to me? Doesn't mention a word of mitzvahs, which is interesting. Let's take a look at another time when you had this problem. <coughs> the Chet Egel. The Bunshin wanted to destroy all Klai Yisrael, in a certain sense, right? And Moshe Rabbeinu had to go up and pray, right? That God should not destroy the Jews. On the contrary, right? <clears throat> so Moshe Rabbeinu says, he finally comes down the mountain, throws the Luchas, the tablets at the bottom of the mountain. What does he say? He doesn't say, all those who didn't sin, me, shelo chayte, all those who didn't sin, please come over to me. He doesn't say that. He says, me la shem elai, who is to God? Let him come to me. What's the difference in language? He should have said, all those people who didn't sin, you guys come over, and then the rest of the people will be punished. He doesn't say that. He says, Mil Hashem, who is ever to God, come to me. Which means that even though you sin terribly with the Chetu Egel, if you are still with God, loyalty, come over to me, you're okay. You'll have a kapora. It, it's amazing when you think about the language that he said. <clears throat> you know, we just pass over very quickly. But what he said was incredible. He never once mentioned the Chet in that sense. You know, whoever did the sin, right? Stay away. And whoever didn't do the sin, come over to me. Nope. He said, who is to God? Who is still loyal even though you sinned? Come over to me. Because in, in the end, that's the defining moment. That's what he said. <clears throat> you know, and so on. And you find that to be true in many, 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 many ways. I mean, just take a look at, uh, you know... Uh, Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef. Here's a guy, right, who's thrown, who's first they try to kill him, right? And then they didn't want to kill him. They changed their mind. They sold him in slavery, which is not a very good social position to be in as a slave, especially in those days in Egypt. And then finally, with the test of Fatifa's wife, he winds up being a prisoner. And I guarantee you being a prisoner in Egypt is the worst possible place that you could be, right? And he's only what? He was 17 when he was kidnapped, all <coughs> right? And he's in his early 20s, 24, 26. He's finished. He can't hire a lawyer to get him out of prison. What's he going to do? Basically, his life's over at the young age of 20 what? 23, 25, whatever, right? What do you think Yosef was thinking? This is insane. I'm one of the 12 tribes, right? Uh, Everybody has abandoned me. My family is gone. I'm a slave or I'm in prison, right? <clears throat> I'm finished. I'm doomed, right? This is irrational because Yosef knew the concept of the 12 tribes. Not only that, he knew he's part of the Tikkun process, you see. So how in the world, am, what am I doing in prison? How am I going to accomplish what I have to accomplish being in prison? It's irrational. None of this makes sense. Of course not. To, to, to Yosef HaTzadik. Uh, Yosef HaTzadik withheld. And he did not abandon God. He's always quoting God. You see. <clears throat> Same concept. Because the Bershom says, no matter where you go, you need to be loyal to me. You see. You need to be loyal. <clears throat> Look, even Yaakov Avino. Yaakov Avinu knew who Yosef was. Yosef was, I once said, a chatziah. Yosef took over the job of Esav. Esav was an of who sinned. So somebody has to take over the job of Esav. <coughs> and Yosef was that person. Yosef wasn't a shevet. He was half a patriarch. And Yaakov knew that because he had to take over the job of Esav. You see. <clears throat> so if that's the case, where's Yosef? He's dead. So Yaakov said, it's over with. I do not have 12 tribes anymore. I only have 11. Not only that, Yosef, who was supposed to take over a job of a Esav, right? He's dead. So that's the end of the whole Tikkun process. It's, it's over. You don't realize what Yaakov realized. And that's why he says, you know, Sha'ila, I'm headed to Gehenim. Because it's over with. There's no Tikkun without 12. And there's no Tikkun without Yosef. 
And yet he's gone, he's dead, right? That's irrational. Because we know Yaakov knew that he has to complete, right? Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, he's the third of. He's got to complete it. Yet it's impossible because Yosef is dead. Irrationality. Of course. Yet Yaakov, of course, remained what he was. Never changed. Never changed one iota. Uh, you see, it's interesting to watch that many times the Bershom doesn't appear as an unknown entity. Doesn't make, well, why is he doing this? But as an irrational entity. Uh, you see, because he's always testing the Jewish people. Do you love me or not? Or will you continue believing in me? Even if you don't do the mitzvahs, will you continue believing in me at some level? Right? Some level. That's what the Rabbi Hashem wants. And that's why that's a classic statement by the Novi Sheker. Hayishkam oyhavim oisi. Do you still love me? I'm not asking if you're still doing the mitzvahs, right? But do you love me? That's what I want to know. Uh, because that's the Akeda. That is what's going to get every Jew, basically, into Ilam Habo. You see, it's called the last card of justice. You see, it's interesting. Uh, that's why the Bonisham created, and that's why he gave Avraham Avinu that Mida of, that Mida uh, of irrationality. Then, of course, we come to Egypt. Egypt is incredible. The Jews are Memteshai Tumah. They're at the 49th level of Tumah, right? We know the sins, they were over with Zara and so on. Certain things that they didn't do, why? They didn't change their name, their dress, their language. Ah, that's the loyalty, you see. That's the loyalty. Even though they were Memteshai Tumah. I mean, we don't even know what the Memteshai Tumah are. You imagine, but it's called the bottom of the barrel, right? That's what it's called, right? Yet the Russian redeemed them. Why? Because they still had the loyalty of that. But it wasn't enough, you see. Because here's Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Moshe Rabbeinu is the Mashiach. The Russian visited him at the snare, which is what? The uh, thorn, bu the bush, right? And he tells him, you're the guy. You gotta take Klai Israel out of Mitzrayim. He's the Mashiach. As soon as Moshe Rabbeinu gets to Egypt, what happens? It gets worse, much worse. Where Paris says, well, they're lazy. Straw. Now, not only do you have to build bricks, make bricks with straw, guess what? You need to gather the straw at night uh, because the amount of bricks has to remain the same. Could you imagine what that is for months? They're gathering straw in the middle of the night, right? They have to go through Egypt. And they didn't have flashlights in those days, right? And go and gather straw in the fields? It's insane. But the kicker, the irrationality was, this was after Mashiach came, not before. So a guy would have said, this is insane. This doesn't make any sense. How could it get worse after the Mashiach, Moshe Rabbeinu, come? It's impossible. This whole thing doesn't make sense. In fact, not only did the Jews have to, probably had that thought, Moshe Rabbeinu had that thought. He comes running back to the Bansham, and he says, uh -uh, Right? Why have you done evil to these people? Right? What in the world does that mean? Well, Moshe had a right to un not understand the Bansham because it was irrational. I'm the Messiah, and it got worse? Right? And he says, you, didn't, uh, and, uh, you sent me to redeem them. I didn't redeem them. It got worse, right? Um, so Moshe Rabbeinu could have asked the bunch of them, you know, maybe you share with me what's going on here. But he didn't. He judged God and found them guilty. Because he said, Loma hare oiso. Why did you do evil to these people? What does that mean? It means he judged God in his mind, and God was evil. That's what it means. So the bunch of says, so obviously, wait a minute. What happened? Moshe Rabbeinu was not loyal. Bad news. You see, uh, he failed. Moshe Rabbeinu failed the test of loyalty. See, and that's why the Bansham says, it's amazing when he says, Rashi brings it down, when the Bansham says, Chaval di Abden, 
Ah, I used to have tzaddikim like Avram Avinu who didn't question me, right? When he went to go and buy, I said, I'm giving him Eretz Yisrael, and he goes and buys the Kevin and Kevin, he paid good cash for this, right? He didn't say, excuse me, why am I paying cash? Uh, I own this country. He didn't question me. And then Yitzchok with the bearers and so on, all right? So the Rosham says, I, ah, we are these guys, they were loyal, they never, they were not mahala after my Midas. They didn't question my Midas. You? As soon as I, I introduce a difficulty, you're already judging me to be guilty of evil? We cannot even begin to understand what that was. In fact, he suffered severely because the Bansham told him, you failed the test of loyalty, right? So as a result of that, you will not redeem the people. You will not go and tear it to throw. So the Bansham tells him that, Atta, now you will see what I will do to the 31 kings. Now, right? But no, Atta, now you will see what I will do to Parai. But you will not see what I do to the 31 kings because you will not bring them into Eretz Israel. He failed the test of the Mashiach. He was Mahara after the Midas of the Banshlam. No loyalty. Avram Avinu would said, I, I don't stand by it. Do whatever you want. It's got to be good. And Moshe Benu didn't do it. You see? So he failed the test of loyalty. What about the Jews? Why did the Banshlam do this to the Jews? With the Xera, uh, you see, where they have to gather the store. And the answer is, because he wanted to test the loyalty of the Jews also, right? Imagine, after Mashiach comes, it gets worse, much worse. Uh, so every Jew is going to say to himself, I can't believe what's going on, right? This makes no sense. It's irrational, because it cannot be. So that was also a supreme test for the Jewish people, you see. But apparently they passed. Unfortunately, Moshe failed. And he was punished because of that, whatever, and so on. <clears throat> so what do we see? When push comes to shove, and there it was, Mem Teshai Tumah, it's the end. So what does the Bersh have to do? Mem Teshai Tumah, they don't deserve to be redeemed. The Sultan is screaming his head off. What are you doing? You bring the Mashiach, Moshe Rabbeinu, and you want to end it? And it almost was the end. If they didn't do the Chet Ego, Moshe Rabbeinu would have been Mashiach Ben Yosef, right? Mm. So the Satan is screaming his head off, you can't do this, they don't deserve, then Mem Teshai Tumah. And you want to bring them to Mashiach, right? What does the Baruch have to do for that? Ya Kedo, loyalty. Okay, let's see. Because loyalty is justice. They don't want to abandon me, how can I abandon them? Forget about the mitzvahs. Okay, it's Mem Tes. You see, that's why that test had to happen to test the loyalty of the Jewish people, because they were at the Memtes Shari Tumah. Oh, very, very important idea, and so on, you see. <clears throat> this is what the Bansham is always doing. Of course he's gonna test you on his sign, will you do the mitzvah or not? Yeah, there's always a test. We are always subjected, right? <clears throat> is the Bansham, are we gonna do the mitzvah or not, and so on, right? What kinds of tests are we gonna keep as commandments, right? But in the end of time, when it's shown that the Jews don't do his mitzvahs, what's the test that he's got to do? Loyalty. He must do that, because that's the only thing that will address the claim of the Sultan. And the Marisham did this to Avram Avinu, you see, and that's why it was the last test to Avram, because he needed that to answer the Sultan. It's a very powerful understanding of what the Bansham needs to answer justice, you see. Mm. So this is basically what happened, right, at the end of time. And I'll tell you something also, which is more of a suid and so on, right? It says there was a, a ram caught in the thicket, entangled by its horns. It says there, right? So right after the Malach says to Avraham Avinu, don't do it, don't, stop, right? So he sees this ram. So Ra Rashi says, who is this ram? I, I out of nowhere. This ram was there, tied up with its horns for 2,000 years, waiting for the Akeda. Rashi says, it's a medrash. Uh, this ram was there for 2,000 years. You see? Excuse me, you couldn't have a regular ram? I mean, what kind of ram lives 2,000 years? What is that supposed to mean? Yet yeah, that's what the medrash says. The ram was there for 2,000 years. This Rashi brings down the Medrash. 
Uh, you see? And not only that, not only it was there for 2,000 years, right? What do we care how it couldn't go forward because it was entangled in his horns? Okay, what's the difference? Horns, feet, what's the difference, right? <clears throat> so what you have to understand, who, what is this ram? You see, mm. and there's an incredible medrash. It's a yalkut, it's a medrash and so on, where the Bosham comes to the Mashiach ben Yusuf and says to him, you should know, at the end of time, your children, Jewish people, will be high of clear. They will have to be killed. Why? Because there's not enough time for a kapora. So it doesn't mean everybody, but there's a great deal of Jews that cannot get Edom Habo because they have no kapora. Uh, that's what he tells the Mashiach ben Yosef. It's a medrash. So what does Mashiach ben Yosef do? Uh, he says, you know, you know what I'll do? Uh-uh. Oh, no. I will accept upon myself the kapora for Klai Yisrael. Not only in my generation when I come, right? But in all the previous generations throughout history of the Jewish people, I will accept upon myself the suffering. I mean, it's beyond belief what he did, what the Mashiach ben Yosef did. And that's why Mashiach ben Yosef, we don't know who he is, because he's basically of enormous suffering, <clears throat> you see. And this is what Ben Yosef says, I will accept. So the Bosham, the Medra says, takes an iron yoke, huge, and he puts it on Mashiach Ben Yosef's neck. And of course he bends, cause, and he starts screaming, he says, I'm a human being, that's really what he is. I can't soil this, I can't bear this weight. So the Bosham says, yeah, but you promise. Because the Bosham needs the Mashiach Ben Yosef to accept the Kapor of Klai Israel. He needs him. And so because if not, a lot of clients will does not get Ilam Abba. It's an incredible medrash. So the Bosham says, okay, I will go in Golis with you. And therefore it will be easier for you to bear and so on. What is the suffering of Mashiach Ben Yosef? Well, that's something which is open to conjecture. But one thing is clear. Whatever the Hanhog of the Bosham is the clients will, will be to the Mashiach Ben Yosef. Which is what? that the Bershom will subject the Mashiach Ben Yosef to incredible irrationality, right? Because we're talking about a person that is unbelievably lofty. To know what he is, and Yeshaya, in Nun Beis, at the end, it says, Hine yaskel avdi, behold, my servant will grow wise, right? Because before that, it was an ignoramus. Who's this servant? So the Targum says, Malka Mashiach. It's Mashiach. And it says three expressions of growth. It says, V'yorim, V'nisa, V'gover Meyoid. So the Medrash asks, why do you have to have three expressions of growth? Because the Mashiach Ben Yosef, in a certain sense, is completely in prison. That's his Yisurim, right? And then it says that he will get out of the prison and become Mashiach Ben Yosef. So what is the first V'yorim, and he will grow Right? So the Medrash says, he will be greater than Avram Avinu. Imagine a guy being, walking amongst us, greater than Avram Avinu. Then the Medrash says, what about Venisa? And he will be very high. So the Medrash says, because he will be greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, we cannot even imagine what that is. And then the Medrash finally says, what about the last expression? The Gova Miyoid, right? He will be exceedingly high. So the Medrash says, he will be greater than the Malachim, the angels. Can you imagine a man walking around with this? You couldn't even look at Moshe Rabbeinu, because he had to wear a mask. Could you imagine looking at the Mashiach ben Yosef? Betikunoi, when he's released, we cannot imagine. You see, <clears throat> meanwhile, when the Mashiach ben Yosef, before he is redeemed, he suffers terribly. And the suffering has to be with the Jews. He is treated in a way which is almost inhuman because the, it has to be completely irrational, just like Klai Yisrael is treated, you see. <clears throat> anyway, and that's why it says, and uh, it says, and the, uh, uh, Avraham Avinu saw the lamb. Who's the lamb? Mashiach ben Yosef, 2,000 years. That lamb represents Mashiach ben Yosef. And that agreement that he made with the Bansham was at the beginning of time. 
That's the 2,000 years since Avraham Avinu and so on, you see? Uh, so that lamb represents Mashiach ben Yosef, right? That is caught up in his horns. Why? Because the horns represent the way the Mashiach ben Yosef will redeem everybody is through Chochmah. The horns are weapons that emanate from the head. Chochmah, wisdom, enormous wisdom, which by the way is the messianic light, will also, that's what, how he redeems everybody, and so on. This is what will happen. Why? Because it says there, and Avraham Avinu offered this ram, tachas benoi, instead of a son. What says tachas benoi instead of a son? It should just say, he offered the lamb, the ram, right? What do you mean instead of a son? Because really Yitzchak should have been on that altar. So he needed a substitute. So he found the Mashiach ben Yosef to be the substitute. So therefore the Bosham is telling him this is the last Nisoyen. When Klai Yisrael will not make it. Which is what he told Mashiach ben Yosef. So you need a substitute. Who is that? Mashiach ben Yosef. Without getting into a more and so on. So we begin to realize there's all kinds of mystical illusions in the Akedah. But the essential thing of the Akedah, loyalty. Because the Bosham needs justice to answer justice. This is what we see so far. <clears throat> you see, mm. in any case, once we understand this, then we now can begin to understand what is happening today, you see. We, we witness irrationality. I mean, civilization never had this. I mean, take a look. You look at America, which represents, right, the epitome of culture, of civilization. I mean, that's what they say, right? You take a look what's going on there, right? First of all, you have the, the LBGTQ, lesbians, I don't want to even go into the Russia table, so that, right? This is insane. And not only that, not only are they accepted, they are now preferred. Everybody is doing or all kinds of institutions, the army, right, the colleges, you have to be LGBTQ or you can't get in. I don't want to go through the whole thing, but it's astounding. Not only is it accepted, it is now preferred that you be this. And then you have the whole concept of transgender. You know, there's no such thing as a gender. You could do whatever you want. And they're teaching this to kindergarten kids. They're destroying the youth. This is what they're doing in America, right? So not only is there abortion where they kill the kid before he's even born, Right? Up to the day of delivery. That's when you, you can kill the kid up to the day of his delivery. Do you believe this? Talk about pure murder, right? <clears throat> That's what's going on. So first, they are okay with killing the kid. And then there's some Michigan, I think it was the Virginia, Virginia man, uh, governor or something like that, who said, no, even after the kid is born, you got 24 hours, you want to murder him or not? You know? So if you and your, the mother and the doctor come to the conclusion that they don't want the kid, kill him <coughs> after he's born. I mean, what, what is this? You know, it's a bunch of murderers. That's basically what it is, right? <clears throat> and then you have pronouns. You can't say he or she. You violate their rights. You see, you have to say people or, or whatever nonsense they come out. And it's, not, it's colleges. I mean, you can't believe what's going on, you see? Uh, then you have that. Then you have all the insanities, you know, the President of the United States, who obviously is uh, it's just beyond belief how he's president and so on, you know? <clears throat> but uh, you have the inflation, you have the crime. 29 <coughs> cities in America where, is the, where the murder rate is now through the roof. The murder rate, because they want to defund the police. Of course, it's the police that's the fault of all this. I mean, is it, are they crazy? I mean, you know, in terms of without the police, you know, it's like uh, there's no murder malchus. And the uh, Perkyova says they would swallow you whole if, you, if there was no murder malchus. Murder malchus is not just the courts, it's the police, and so on. Mm. I mean, when you think about it, it's insane. Then you have the tremendous rise of anti Semitism in America and around the world, right? Then you have what? You have, uh, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, well, Eretz Israel, the Arabs kill, <clears throat> right? And one of the things that are actually incredible, Finally, they're waking up, you know. But uh, how in the world do you prohibit people from carrying a gun? It's incredible. Every Arab knows that every Jew is a sitting duck. He knows that. 
You can't defend yourself. You don't have any weapons, right? So he can go and kill you. Uh, those seven people, Nebuch, who died, had they guns? Maybe a guy would have got away with killing one, but the other people would put out their gun and kill him. Of course, they're all sitting ducks. Uh, you know, Israel, in a certain sense, has become a very dangerous country, in that sense, where it could strike at you anywhere. So how could you prohibit people from defending themselves? So the whole thing is irrational, you see. And I'm not even talking about the previous government of Lapid and Lieberman and so on, you know, with the irrational, the war against the Haredim, the war against God, because that's basically what it is, you know. Then you have what's going on in the world. You have Putin against Ukraine, it's wiping out Ukraine. And then you have China, Xi, right? He, he he's, uh, wants to control 1.4 billion people. The world is filled with evil, irrationalities. So therefore one would say, you know, whatever happened to God? It's called less din, less dying. There's no din, there's no justice anymore. Everybody can get away. And what about that World Economic Forum that took place, you know, that, that crazy conspir conspiracy and so on, you know? Um, the world has become a, not only an evil place, it violates the rules of civilization throughout, you see. Mm -hmm. So one wonders, where is the Rabbanu Shalom? What have happened? It's not just the Holocaust, you see. The Holocaust was one nation, right? Nazi Germany and so on. Okay, there always have been evil nations. But the whole world is mad. So where is the Rabbanu Shalom? There's no din, there's no justice, and there's no dayan, and there's no judge to judge, uh, you see. And that's irrational. Me, because everybody looks and says, wait a minute, the Bansham stands for justice, right? He is the one who controls, right? He's in charge. He directs the world and so on. He's gone. Uh, that's irrational, you see. It doesn't make sense. Therefore, the world basically is insane. You know, not insane in a psychological sense of being psychotic, but they are insane in terms of the merida. Everybody's rebelling, almost against God, because that's really what it is. I mean, look at the Democratic Party in America, the progressives, right? These people are unbelievable rishayim. You see, they are terribly evil people. What they're doing to 330 million people in America is, is incredible and so on, you know? And then you have the era of Rav here, you know? It's insane. And like I said, because the Boisham is pushing us to the end, to the brink, he must see, what are we going to do? Are we going to abandon him, give up totally? Or in some way, grab something about Judaism. I don't care if it's a matzah <laughs> on Pesach, right? Uh, or if it's a, a bris milah, right? Or send your kid to a, one day to learn how to read Hebrew. Whatever it is, there has to be some way or to declare yourself, well, I'm proud of a Jew whatever, even though I don't keep anything and so on. There has to be something where a person can declare that I am Jewish and I'm proud to be Jewish, no matter what it is, you know. And it's interesting, people deep down do have an affinity to being Jewish, even though we never see it that way, but they do and so on. <clears throat> so that's a very important idea. Another idea that determines is the Sutton who's screaming his lungs off. I don't know if angels have lungs, but he's screaming. What is he saying? He's saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? You want to bring Mashiach, because we are holding at the end. You can't do that, right? Because Jewish people are at the Memteshai Tuma. We are. This world is so terribly contaminated with sin and evil. So the Sutton is saying, you can't bring the Messiah, the Mashiach, and we are right at the threshold, you see, because they don't deserve it. The Messianic era is an era that we cannot comprehend its glory or its joy. As obviously, when you have a person like one I mentioned, come, right, it's incredible. So the Sutton is trying to stop it at all costs. So he was successful in stopping it in America, right? Trump was doing a tremendous job, right, of elevating America. And because uh, I, I've said this many times, whatever, but uh, Trump is an individual, basically, that has started the messianic process. 
because people don't realize that Esau does tshuva, and he is Esau doing tshuva, which I've said many times and so on. So therefore, this is what is happening. Oh, okay, and to show you, and remember the main job of Esau, even though he became a Russia, the main job in the end will be Rav Yavoytsoya. The older will serve the younger. That's the prophecy. That means in the end, Esau has to do tshuva and help the Jewish people do the tikkun, right? That's what it is. And therefore, in the end of time, Esau will do tshuva, who I feel is Trump. Abraham Accords, it's unheard of, right? That he did that, right? And that when he gets back in, which I feel he will, and finish the job, right? Finish the job. It's not, don't even think about counting him out, you know? So there's a, between now and then, a lot of water is going to pass under that bridge, um, right? And then so on, you know? Uh, and there are many reasons why, you know? It's very possible that DeSantis won't even challenge him. Because for him, his sake, he should not. It's a very big mistake, just as an aside, for DeSantis to challenge Trump. Everybody else is nobody. There's nothing there. The only challenge is from DeSantis, which is a tremendous mistake. If you want to know why, first of all, Trump should have had five heart attacks by now. The amount of persecution that he's subject to, it would kill anybody. Any normal human would have killed. All right? And he's just like water off a duck's back. It's incredible. DeSantis is not proven. He gets that kind of stuff, right? Opposition, he can drop dead in a moment. You, I mean, could you imagine what it is to be sued every moment? Do you know how much money you have to have to hire lawyers? I mean, it, it's, it's astounding what he's got to go through. And who's after him? We're not talking about some local guy in the street. The federal government is after him. With the DOJ, Department of Justice, the FBI, right? The Intelligence Department, they're all after him. Could you imagine? And they have unlimited resources. So he is proven. You see, he can survive. DeSantis is not proven at all. And I want to tell you something. They're going to make schmutz out of DeSantis. The progressives, the Democratic Party, if he's nominated, they will destroy him. They will character assassinate him, just like they did with Trump, because they will not tolerate that, obviously, you know? So can he tolerate that character assassination by the Democratic Party? Not only that, what's his rush? He's only 43 years old. What's his rush? He'll wait four years, right, or whatever, and 48 will run for president. There's no point in it, you see, because it's not that there's nobody to run. There is, right? There is to run Trump. He doesn't have to replace Trump because Trump is very adequate, very eligible to do a great job. So what's his rush, you see, <clears throat> and so on. In any case, it's a big mistake because if he runs and he loses to Trump, which he will, right, then it's a mark against them. Because whenever you lose, sinish good, and so on, you know? And he's got time. Not only that, like I said, they're going to go after him. If he becomes, gets a nomination, they're going to schmet the DeSantis, mm -hmm. just like they did to, and they're going to sue him. And he's not a billionaire like Trump, right? He's going to have to pay to protect himself and so on. Anyway, it's a very bad move. I hope he remembers and he thinks about this. And he drops out and says, eh, I, I don't need to do this. I'll do it after Trump retires. Because he can only run one more term, term and so on, right? And so on and so on. But in any case, this is what's called the low, the low in the messianic process. Why? Because of the Sutton. The Sutton says, you want to stop the world, right? Because of the Memteshai Tumah. No, you can't because the Mashiach is a person that will, is sublime. It's incredible what he'll do to the world. And nobody deserves it. So Benjamin says, you're right. So I have to make the world suffer. I have to satisfy justice, right? So we already know one way to do that, the test of loyalty. I need justice to answer justice. So the test of loyalty is one way. But the second way is to satisfy the Satan, right? And introduce tremendous yisur and suffering, which is also what happened in Egypt, you see. So therefore the Bansham decided that he's gonna stop Trump because it's going too fast. He's got to satisfy the justice, right? And make people suffer. So, of course, how did he do that? It's amazing what the Bunchman can do. It's simply amazing. COVID. 
because of COVID, Biden was able to hide in his basement and campaign, right? Nobody knew that guy's, uh, what is he, uh, an absolute moron. <clears throat> nobody, nobody knew that because he was in his basement because of COVID. This is why, you see. So the Brunisham brought COVID to allow Biden to win and make the United States suffer. And the whole world is suffering because of that, you see. Not only that, he destroyed the economy, which is Trump's signature uh, law. He destroyed that. You see, all of this is putting on hold. It's the equivalent of Biden is the equivalent of the gzer of straw in Egypt, where he put Moshe Rabbeinu on hold, right? On hold because they didn't deserve it. You needed the test of loyalty. You had to satisfy justice with more suffering and so on. And then he could bring Moshe Rabbeinu to destroy Egypt. Same idea. So I believe that Trump's coming back in 2024 and so on. Because then Biden, now where do you see this? Because you already see that these guys are losing already. In America, right, Biden's losing. I mean, how does a guy have top secret documents all over his home? You know, it's almost like I expected him to use the top secret documents for wallpaper. <laughs> in his house. You know, you're looking at the wall, there's a top secret document here. There's one over here. It's insane. These are top secret documents. These are the most guarded documents in America. And they're all over the place. They're in a garage, right next to his Corvette. They're in his office. They're on his table. I mean, what is, 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 is he out of his mind? Yes. That's really the answer. Answer your own question. Right? And so on. So therefore, he already, people realize there's something wrong with this guy. It's incredible. You can't even trust this guy with top secret documents. So you see the Bosham is, also, is already after Biden to, to get rid of the guy. It's a very good sign. Very good sign. So it's telling us, right, that the end is very near. What Bosham says, enough is enough. I want to redeem the Jewish people. And in Eretz Israel, same thing. First time in history, right, that the government of Israel has nobody on the left. Nobody. Right. Nobody. It's amazing. It's Bibi and it's also the Haredim and the right, the, the right and so on. You know, uh, there's nobody on the left. There's no Lapid. There's no Lieberman. Right. There's, none of these, there's no merits. They're completely out. That was a miracle. It's a Nes Nigla. And what's even a bigger Nes Nigla, right, is Ben Gavir. Three years ago, this was guy persona non grata, right? He was the last guy anybody would ever think would be in the government. Not only is he in the government, which is a miracle, you know, <clears throat> number one, right? But he's the minister of security. And not only that, he's been granted greater powers than the original minister, you know, by the Knesset and so on. How in the world did this happen? It's interesting to look and see what the Bunchum seems to be doing. And I always feel that Ben Gavir is a Trump character. He has the same ability of defiance. Very strong-willed person, and he can defy. So it's very interesting what his future will be. But in any case, without getting into that, uh, so you see in the Eretz Yisrael, what you're wit witnessing is the beginning of the end of the era of Rav. That's what it is. And the era of Rav, right, America's at war with each other. The good part of Asaph and warring with the bad part of Asaph. That's really what's going on. Trump is the good part of Asaph. Warring with the bad part, the bad part of Asaph is who? Is the Democratic Party and the progressive. Progressives, they are destroying America, you see. And then it's just real, it's the era of Rav against the Frommer. It's really what it is. Or I really should say the era of Rav against God. It's not the Frommer that they hate. Don't, don't. It's really God, don't tell me what to do. That's what it is. They want to remain secular. Uh, but what you see what the Bajma has done is thrown out the era of Rav. It's a very important simon that seems to indicate that it's over. But guess what? The Sutton is screaming his head off. Wait a minute, you know, these are my guys. The era of Rav, these guys who commit, you know, who want, want to defy God. These guys, right, uh, they're my guys. You can't throw them out. Where's justice for this? The people in Israel don't deserve this. So many of them are not religious. That's the Sutton. 
So Baruch Hashem says, you're right, right? And I'm going to have to bring suffering and so on. But what's interesting is the Baruch Hashem, because of justice, has to back off. And I, I feel, who is the instrument of the heir of Rav in Israel? The courts. The courts. It's astounding what Aram Barak did. I find it incredible. He literally destroyed the operation of a democratic state and made the courts the supreme decider, right? He can oppose the Knesset. He can make his own laws. And he can appoint an attorney general that actually can stop the Knesset from making laws. I mean, it's unheard of in any country in the world. And then three judges who appoint besides the other six, they can actually override the other six. It's just incredible what he had, he, he's done, uh, you see, because the court is the last vestige of the heir of Rav in the government of Israel to destroy the religion. That's really what it is. So the Sutton won, that Taina. You can't do this to my guys. The one said, okay, I'll relent. I'll bring, uh, you're right, I'll take one of my guys and throw him out. Who? Derry. That's why Derry got thrown out. Because he, that, that was a concession to the Sutton. I, I have to concede, because he's, he's saying they don't deserve, they don't deserve uh, Mashiach now. So the Mashiach says, okay, so I'll weaken my side, which is the from a side, Haredi, and therefore they won. So they, they threw out of the government a guy who was a major force. You see, you, you realize everything is orchestrated in an incredible way. This is what's happening, you see. Mm. So the good news is that we seem to be on the way because there are things that are happening that are not normal. It just it takes time and so on. So there are two major things that are operating at the end of time. One, as I said, is you have to remember the, the rule is the Bershom must adhere to justice. He's not going to bring the Mashiach unless Jews deserve it. But in that sphere, they can deserve it one of two ways, or actually both ways. One is to enormously increase the suffering, like he did in Egypt, in order for them to serve, right, as a kapora, the chatoim. And the second one is the test of loyalty, which I brought from Akeda. Uh, that's what we see. These are the two major forces, rules, that are operating at the end of time. And that's why you will see back and forth, you see. But besides this, in order for the loyalty to be operative, if that's the case, then the Bershom has to appear irrational. And what that means is he's going to look like he abandoned the world. Let's din, let's die in. There's no judge and there's no judgment, you see, where everybody can do whatever they want. And that, knowing who the Bershom is, is absolutely impossible to understand. It's irrational, makes absolutely no sense, you see, <clears throat> and so on. So this is basically what the end of time looks like and why it's always insane, either because of tremendous amount of Yisurin and people are suffering because of the cost of living and because of the inflation and the southern border is a, it's unbelievable what's going on down there. The crime in the cities, defunding the police and so on. Uh, and even in, in, in Israel, the cost of living is very high. It's impossible, I don't know, anybody can make a living in this place. <clears throat> and so on, you know what they say, if you want a small fortune in Israel, you gotta come with a big one, you know, and so on. <clears throat> and so that, that doesn't make any sense. Then the Arabs, it's like a Turkish shoot. They can go wherever they want, kill Jews, because they forbid people from defending themselves. That's irrational, uh, you see. But it's not only that. The bureaucracy and regulations of Eretz Israel is, honor is onerous, it's terrible. It prevents so much from happening because of the bureaucracy and the, uh, and the regulations and so on. Then you have the cost of living, and then the real estate here is impossible, <coughs> and so on, you know? And I once told a politician an interesting idea. Do you remember the Homestead Act? America had the West. They bought it, Louisiana Purchase and so on. They had to settle it, but that's 3,000 miles long or 1,500 miles long, right? How did they settle the West? They did the Homestead Act. They said, we will give you an acre of land for free, but the deal is you have to build on it. So people move West. 
Imagine if Israel would say, the Negev. Whoever wants can have an acre or a dunam. Here it's a dunam, right? For free. Or we'll charge you a nominal fee, right? 10,000 shekel, whatever, right? But the deal is, you have to go and develop it. What an idea. That's exactly what America did. And that's how they, right? That's how they occupied the whole America and so on. I guarantee you, if it did that, you right? They, they'd fill up the Negev, you know, in three months. Also the Galil. Sure, and the same thing with the Galil and so on, you know. There's so many different ways, I think, that Israel can really progress rapidly. You know, if they would get rid of that leftist progressive mentality, which in many ways destroys the potential of Israel. In any case, but listen, all this will happen because we see that the Rebbeinu is clamping down. That's what we see, you see. So therefore, I believe that it will happen, you know, hope, perhaps with, hopefully with this government or whatever. And uh, I mean, now, you know, everybody's worried about the security. So I think they are becoming more rational. Well, they said that they want to pass a law where it's much easier to get a gun, you know, to protect yourself and so on, you know. So I believe it's going to happen very shortly. And we are in the holding pattern right now. And uh, this goes, be, uh, whether it be for America or for uh, uh, Eretz Israel. it's interesting that simultaneously they're both going through tremendous changes, you know, because the main thing is Ace of doing tshuva and the air of Rav and so on, you know, <clears throat> and so on, the, the, uh, to bring the, the Rabbanshan back. But I believe there will be tremendous nisim, just like, like we see now, in order to bring back uh, the belief in God. Because I believe that when the Mashiach does come, which means when he's let out of his Yisurin, that the Baruch must raise Klai Yisrael to a tremendous spiritual height. He's not going to let the Mashiach Ben Yosef look at the Jewish people that is so diminished in stature. It's terrible to do that. Uh, look, you see that by Egypt. When the Jews, to, each, each uh, Makkah in Egypt was a tremendous Makkah, right? But it wasn't just a Makkah to the Egyptians, a blow to the Egyptians. It was a revelation of God's power to the Jewish people. So what God did before he took them out, oh no, he's not going to take them out in the Memtes. So he elevated them in terms of insight into who he was. So every Makkah of Egypt had an unbelievable insight to who God is. Because that's really what the Makkahs were, you know, and so on, you know. And then when they were stood by Kriya Samsov, right, they saw aspects of God that even Yecheskel Novi never saw. So again, he raised them in insight and knowledge of God. And then finally, of course, they stood at Mount Torah, right, where they heard the voice of God. That's going to repeat itself. With the Jewish people, God will give them a change in consciousness. We don't know how, uh, and so on. That's going to raise their understanding of God. And it's going to raise their understanding or their ability to know who God is. Because then the Mashiach will come to a people that has been raised to tremendous spiritual heights, uh, you see. And you have Sukkim that says that, where it says in the Tzavim, even if you're outcast, be at the ends of heaven. That's how far and how low the Jews will be. From there, I will gather you. That means God is going to go into the nation itself, into the Gullahs, and he will gather them. It's the first one. Then it says, and he will take you to him, which is Torah. He will elevate them spiritually. And then he will bring them to Eretz Israel, which is interesting. So the end of the Gula starts outside Eretz Israel. Because that's what it means. After that, he will take them to Eretz Israel. <clears throat> How that will happen is unknown. But there is, an hint, there is a hint. Most people don't realize what the third base Amigdash is. But apparently the Gemara holds and it brings proof to you, Shalmi and Maise Shani, that the base Amigdash will be bu built not in the time of Mashiach ben David. It will be built before Mashiach ben David. Who's that? Mashiach ben Yosef. That's when it will be built. So wouldn't it be something if you woke up one morning, right? And you just happen to be looking 
at the old city. And guess what? There's a third base amigdash. Wouldn't that be incredible? That would wake up the entire Jewish world like nothing can, right? It would shock the entire planet and it would begin uh, the end of the exile, the building of the base amigdash, and the entry of the Mashiach himself to Kleisville. So, it looks like it's going to happen very shortly, I hope, right? And uh, look, let's be ready for it. But remember, the key, me Lashem Eli, who is unto God? Loyalty, no matter what you do, don't abandon God. That's the key we receive from the Akedah. And then you will surely be in Eilim Haba because of that alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi. We uh, open the question. If you do so, I forgot to mention the Rabbi speaking here again. February 26th, Sunday night? Yeah, it's Sunday night. Title? Anyway, Purim. Something to do with Purim. And uh, so, also, Bizrat Hashem will have Mari tonight after. Guys can stick around. Any questions? I just want to make sure that people know that Rabbi Kessin has a Facebook page. Oh. And also he has a website. And for those of us who are visual learners more than auditory learners, okay, it's torahthinking.org. And there are links to over 500 shirim in different places on the internet. The website also has its own collection. <coughs> of shirim and transcriptions. There are over 100 <coughs> transcriptions that are, um, that, that are, uh, <coughs> some are mated with the audio or the video, and then there's some that are, that are but there's a compendium of over 500 shirim and links to the transcription, those that have transcriptions. So yeah, now we're thinking, word. <laughs> it's an amazing resource. Truly. Yes. So what is the war of Gok and the Gok fit into all this? That's a very, very good question. Can the world repeat every question? Leave this question. Well, the, the woman would like to know where is the war of Goig and Mogoig? Okay? The truth is the war of Goig and Mogoig is a war, obviously, but a lot of people don't realize that that war is a war against Mashiach ben Yosef. You see, it's a war against the Mashiach himself. So that war can only transpire after Mashiach ben Yosef comes. Right. So when he comes and he begins to awaken Klai Yisrael, there's going to be the last resurgence of evil to try to stop it. Because they realize that their way of life is over. So that's really what Goyg and Mogri really is. So what's it going to look like when the Mashiach ben Yosef appears? I mean, is he here now? <clears throat> is Mashiach ben Yosef here now? Yeah. Maybe. The problem is, since he accepted the tremendous amount of suffering for the Jewish people, he could be sitting next to you. Was that your husband? <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure, right? Mm -mm. Well, no, if the United States is sending tanks to Ukraine. Putin is going to, you know, not, is, is very unhappy about this, and he's threatening, you know. Yeah, of course. So, is that going to be, you know, I don't know, the war? No, Ukraine is not the war. Uh, what Ukraine seems to be all about is called payback time. Ukrainians have been killing Jews for 400 years. Ever since Khmelnyky in 1648, wiped out one-third of European Jewry, right? And they have been doing a great job killing Jews. In fact, uh, in World War II, they were more vicious than the Nazis. In fact, the Nazis had to say, you know, they, well, well, we like the fact you're killing Jews, let's show you how to be more efficient. You have Babi Yar, I don't want to go, whatever, you know? So what's interesting is before the end of time, the Bunchman says, well, Ukraine has been especially active in killing Jews, so what I'm gonna do is destroy them. And what's amazing is two points. One, Zelensky. Zelensky, I hate to say it, he's an idiot. Why? Because Putin never threatened him. 
He never threatened the sovereignty of Ukraine. Just like Kennedy said to Khrushchev, if you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want you in the North, Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to stop them because that's called the Kennedy Doctrine. So what Putin said, I don't want you to join NATO. That all he said. He didn't say anything more than that. And of course, Zelensky wants to be a hero. That's basically what he wants to cash in on, right? And he said, no. Why? He should have said, okay, I won't join NATO, not threatening my sovereignty, and that's it, I'll wait till you're dead, because anyway, Putin is probably very sick, and so on. So what the Bajram did is very interesting. He got a Jew to destroy Ukraine. <laughs> right? Talk about me, the Kinegid me, the right? And the amazing thing about that is not only that, it's not only that, but everybody thinks Zelensky is a hero or else it would be an unbelievable surge of anti-Semitism. So a Jew destroyed Ukraine. It's billions of dollars, $200 billion worth of damage. One third of Ukraine is destroyed, right? For no reason, you see? Because this guy wants to be the actor, you know, the, you know, the uh, sh showmanship and so on, right? So Ukraine is, is, it's payback. That's really what it is, you know? And Putin himself is destroying Russia. Because everybody now looks at Putin as a third-rate country. The invincibility of the Russian army is gone. You know, they can't even take over Ukraine and, and so on, you know. So that itself is an oinish to Russia. So there's a lot of chesbonos, as they say, reckonings going on. But the important thing about the war of Goyg and Magoy is that it is a war against Mashiach ben Yosef. The, the way you see this is when Egypt was destroyed, the Jews went to Kriya Samsev, and then they ran after the Jews again. That means that there will be a resurgence of evil after the Mashiach comes. And that's really what the war against uh, the Jews in, by the Yamsuf. that's really what it represents. The attempt of evil to overtake, right, and to reclaim their, their uh, preeminence over the Jewish people. So it hasn't happened yet. What form it will take is unknown, but if you take a look around the world, you can begin to see there's a tremendous anti-Semitism brewing, you know, really a lot, uh, and so on. So from there, somebody will come and, and do it. Yeah? Would you say that the real true test of the loyalty of the Jews will be at that war of God and God? Well, it, or <coughs> before or then? Loyalty is a test that's continuous. It's not just here or there, you know. There's no question that there will be, uh, you know, ideas of loyalty and so on, you know. But it, it, it's a continuous process, you see. Yeah. What about the threat of China? What about what? What about the threat of China? That's, that some people say that they are aiming to send rockets towards America. No, they'll never do that because you, no, the U.S. can take them off the map in one week. We, you have no idea of the firepower of the United States. Mm -hmm. Between all the kind of bombs they got, you know, the nuclear bomb, the, the neutron bomb, then they can zap the whole electronic circuitry. China doesn't stand a chance against the UN, uh, US. Of course not, they know that. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do you think they're not attacking Taiwan? Because they know there will be a tremendous response from the US. They don't want to go to war. Besides, the US is the main customer of China. Right? You don't want to destroy your customer base. Right? Uh, without U.S., there's no customer base. You know, who's going to buy their stuff? Right? So you're not looking at uh, a war between the U.S. They're going to try to avoid that war at all costs, you know, unless China was threatened regionally. But they're not going to be threatened regionally. So I, would, I wouldn't even lose sleep over that. Yeah? Well, you're saying that the fact that a lot of Chiloni Israelis... The fact that what? The fact that a lot of Chiloni Israelis um, still <coughs> feel that they're Jewish, that, you know, they'll do a bread and uh, they'll right. by whatever, that that's enough loyalty for Hashem? Yes. Even that little bit, that connection? We have no idea what that little bit means. What to you may be a little bit, to the Shalom is an enormous amount of, of dedication for the Jews. Look, you have to remember, uh, the Jews are in a period of terrible darkness. There's not a, you look around, we're, you know, the are dying every day, I, I hate to say it, 
a tremendous amount of, there's Rebbers, there's, there's, you know, there's Rosh Hashivas, they're dying. It's incredible how much COVID took out. There are reasons for that, right? So if you think about it, it's black. I mean, how is a guy supposed to be from when there's nothing there? It's a vacuum. We live in a vacuum. So that itself adds to the onus. That's part of the reason why the Rebbe takes Gedolim. Because then a guy can say, what do you want from me? I had no Gedolim to, to watch and to look. There was no what's called hashpor, And that's a taina that mitigates the judgment. So what the Rebbe does is he adds all of it together. You see? Uh, so if a Jew says, you know, look, you know, uh, I, I believe in Israel. You know, I believe in Jewish history. I don't, I don't do any mitzvahs. Yeah. That's a tremendous mitzvah. We don't realize. But, and it's apparently enough to satisfy justice. And that's what the Rebbe must do. Not that he must. He does what he wants. But he created the world through justice. And he wants the Jews to, to deserve, you know, the uh, Olim Haba through justice, which they will get. That gives me a lot of hope. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Um, with Mashiach Ben Yosef, the, the Indian of the Hesped in Yerushalayim, it seems oh. also to indicate that Mashiach Ben Yosef will die. Right. So I'm curious what the Russ, you know, perspective on, on the death of Mashiach Ben Yosef is. Well, I'll tell you, okay. The problem is Yosef in Egypt sinned. And Yosef is the neshama of the Mashiach ben Yosef. Hey, that's who he was, really, and so on, right? <coughs> Without getting into it. <coughs> and it, it was a gzair that he has to die because he didn't completely uh, vanquish the Yetzirah for, for Tifa's wife. I don't want to get into why. <laughs> anyway, it was decreed, you know? So, and that would have been terrible for Klai Yisrael. Why? Because if the Mashiach ben Yosef does die, right? then it means that Christ will also will come to a tremendous destruction. Anyway, the, the Vilna Goyen, one of them, uh, says the following. The terror is Muram is that he will not die. Because it says, Oi Yosef Chai. Yaakov Avinu said, Oi Yosef Chai. I thought he was dead, but he still lives. That means Beremez, that he won't die. So how does the Ronsham take charge? Or, uh, you know, he brings back the Nisham of Mashiach ben Yosef, right, in every generation, and he subjects him to a tremendous suffering. So if you added it all up, it would kill him, you see? But since it's spread over, right, he doesn't die, and he will survive to do his job, you see? So he doesn't die. Because in the Zoya, there's two expressions that he does, and one expression that he won't. So therefore, Mashiach ben Yosef is an ongoing... He is the... Right. It's an ongoing suffering, right, and so on. In fact, the, the Ari says, when we pray in Shmon Esrei, Es Semach David. Who is the Tzemach? The offshoot of David, Mashiach ben Yosef. We are praying every day for Mashiach ben Yosef not to die. You see? And the remez, like I said, is Oid Yosef ben Yichai. It's interesting remez. You know? Yeah. How do you explain the rising threat from within Israel by the Arabs here, <coughs> in the south, in the north, really to a very significant threat on the state of Israel from within? Yes. From How do you explain right, that? Israeli Arabs. Right, yeah. Uh, the idea to that, it's interesting. Yishmuel, which is the origin of all these, uh, did chuva in the end, because he let Yitzchak go first. Uh, when Avraham Avinu died, he let Yitzchak. So the Chazal learned that Yishmuel did tshuva. In fact, that's why you have Tanoim who are named Rabbi Yishmuel. How could you name your son after a, a Russia? So obviously Yishmuel did tshuva, the famous Rabbi Yishmuel in Kohen Gadol, right? Anyway, but uh, so, uh, so Yishmuel does tshuva in the end also. And that's why uh, Trump was able, so Edoim, Esav, Trump, Together with Yishmuel, both of them do Jutshuva. But just like there's a Toiv Shebe and a Rosh Shebe there's a Toiv Shebe Yishmuel and a Rosh Shebe Yishmuel, you see. So the evil of Yishmuel, because he was a Russia even from a great deal of his life and so on, right? So therefore they, they battle. So what you're really looking at is a contest among the Arabs themselves. 
because there are <coughs> Arabs that are very disturbed. Uh, or there are, or, you know, what, what is happening and so on. So unfortunately right now, just like, just like the progressives are on, on, on head, the same thing with the PLO and so on, they are now dominate that. But I believe that ultimately speaking, Saudi Arabia will join, oh yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it, because it's to make peace, because it's to their benefit. You see, not only because of Iran, because Israel is doing great, you know, economically and uh, technologically and all that. So why shouldn't they join with Israel and so on, you know? And they want to become, they want to enter the 21st century or 21st century and so on. So I believe once they join, you know, that's the spearhead of Yishmael, is Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. They're the real Muslim and so on, you know, right. So I believe once Trump gets back in, he's going to proceed with the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to do that. In fact, it's may even possible, I think Bibi is dreaming that he wants to be the guy to bring Saudi Arabia. Yeah, like, of course. You know what a prize that would be? Because it's not Saudi Arabia. The whole Arab world would change. Because the real, the real Muslims are Saudi Arabia. They have Mecca. They're the, the caretakers of Islam. Right, yeah. So I believe he's really thinking about that, you know. You know, you just have to get rid of these guys like Sullivan and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, and, uh, Blinken. And uh, Blinken and all these. By the way, Sullivan and Blinken are Jewish. I don't know if you know oh. that. Most people don't realize that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sullivan is Jewish. Interesting last name. And Blinken is Jewish. Both Yidin, you know? And, and so on. And, and Biden, you know? Yeah. yeah I was going to ask you. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to challenge you on your uh, theory that uh, Trump has a shot of getting back. He's a what? That Trump has a chance of getting back. You want to challenge me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, you know the, the door, the entrance, the exit of this shul is right over there. <laughs> I'm jo joking. Why, wh what's your challenge? My, my challenge is that... Right now I hear an opinion. What's the challenge? Yeah, the, yeah, the challenge yeah. is that um, we know that uh, from the metrics that the last straw before uh, Hashem sent the Babel was when they... Um, was when they started handing out marriage documents. Right, man right, and man. right. And uh, <coughs> the thing, with 2015, you know, the Supreme Court. Uh, right, yeah, I'd say that, right. And I think just like two, a month ago, they, they doubled down on it. Right. And I'm asking myself, if they double down on it, how do they have, how is there a <coughs> shot of yeah. Hashem giving them, giving this society any other chance <coughs> to have any form or semblance of true yeah. Look, first of all, you have to look at the, uh, what's called the practicality. The Bunchman does not want to destroy America. He's not going to do that, you know, because there are hundreds of millions of America that are not gay. They're not that way. There's a, the, I mean, if you look at what's the total population that are LGBTQ, right? And maybe it's 10% or whatever, and the, the rest of America just follows along because they have no leadership. It's the progressive and democratic party. But uh, first of all, the Russian doesn't want to destroy America. You see that he's always come to the assistance of America, uh, you know, and so many, many, many times in, you know, the world wars and so on, and in slavery, you know, and so on. Uh, but in any case, the, the main idea is that uh, because he doesn't want to, he's going to somehow, uh, you know, at least block the tremendous, uh, you know, um, uh, permissiveness of this movement and so on but he will punish America I mean there's no question about that but there's a difference between punishing America and destroying America so he'll punish America and that's what's happening now that's one of the things COVID does is it punishes America I mean I, 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 I heard that or whatever 70% of America considers themselves poor they can't afford it between the gas prices the grocery prices is insane, you know? And you're taking a look at all the other prices, the electric, everything's going up, you see. <clears throat> so that is Yisurin for that. But the main thing to remember is he doesn't want to destroy America, you see? He will punish America rather severely. I mean, the fact that people are getting killed in many of the cities, the crime rate, it's all part of the Yisurin. The inflation is part of the Yisurin. Grocery prices, all that is Yisurin, you know? So he can do it that way. 
without destroying America. At the same time, <coughs> he's going to put, I believe, Trump will win the election. And don't even think that it can't happen, because the first election was purely miraculous. It's a nesnigla. How in the world did Trump become president of the United States? It's impossible. You know, even a book, it wouldn't take odds that he would, you know, would, would or would not become president and so on, you know? He'd just win by another nest, that's all. Because he really is fit. Forget about his character. Asaph is that way. <clears throat> you have to remember, Asaph had three characteristics. Tremendous Balgaiva, tremendous Baltaiva, and he's a fraud, imposter. Trump, I hate to say it, but he's a big Balgaiva, although he's a nice guy, but he's a big Balgaiva, right? Yeah, I mean, look, if you had $8 billion, it'd also look that way, right? Uh, so he's a big Balgaiva, he's a tremendous Balgaiva, that we know, but he's honest. He's an honest guy. He, what he says, he really means. That doesn't mean he doesn't lie once in a while, I mean, everybody does. But he really, look, he, I want to tell you something, somebody who's made all that money, who has all that fame, what else is important to him in life? To accomplish great things for mankind. That's it. So he's an honest guy, and he really wants to do good for America, you know. So what America is deficient in, they'll get punished. And what they excel in, they'll be rewarded. But the Russian wants America, Esau, to help the Jewish people. So therefore, they will not be destroyed. You see? So uh, he's, uh, I believe he will win. And uh, how it'll happen, you know? Desire for um, Asa's role is <clears throat> sparing of right. what, what should be complete destruction. What could have been right, exactly, yeah. Yes. Look, the, the, the role of the world in terms of bringing the tikkun always dominates, even if individually that person doesn't. But if he's needed for the world or for Clyde's will, he will, he will succeed. Wait, anybody here uh, asking? Just yeah. Klaus, Klaus Schwab. Who? Head of the World Economic Forum. Klaus and the Great Schwab. Reset. How does that fit into this world order? <coughs> Evil. Sure, right? So right. What happens to them? Yeah, it, all it is is a collective band of guys that want to dominate the world. They want to take over and kill whatever they want to do and so on and so forth. All it is is the enormous proliferation of evil. That's what, just like China. And they'll get white, they'll get... Yeah, of course, well, well, all of this will disappear when Mashiach comes. It's all over. There was a poll yes. within the last week that all of the guys that were contending right. against okay. Trump for the possible mm -hmm. nomination, they, they don't even come close. Of course Trump not. Is way in the front. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that you know, as far as Ukraine is concerned, you left out the fact that they had in the tunnels millions of children that uh, they had produced. Uh, they were the main manufacturers of that adrenochrome or whatever that thing is called. That uh, what's his name went to uh, still alive. People that are dead we think are still alive. But also, you use the word deserve that we deserve something. I think you should replace it with the word we because we don't deserve anything. We should earn it. It's a matter of earning it rather than deserving it. That's well, uh, I mean earn. Well, when you earn it, then you earn it. Now, as far as... Deserving to earning. And then, as far as... Um, uh, That's what I meant. Um, uh, God, my God, you, you say the word spirituality, but so part of that war is consciousness. Would you, would you say that? Yeah. It's war against consciousness? Yeah, yes, sure. Because they're trying to, they're trying to brainwash all, all of America. Right. That's all the and evil part. Israel. Right. I agree. You know, uh, next, I wanted to, the main question I had for you was that I wanted to always know why didn't, because you, you, you made a, the, 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 the essence or the, the, uh, the essence of the, of the Akeda, why didn't Yitzchak go to his mother's funeral? Why didn't Yitzchak go to his mother's funeral? I was I'm kind of curious. Just. Um, I was told that there's a possibility that he actually did a, 
I mean, that, that's not anything I spoke about tonight, right? Well, you you just it's off the. Right, yeah. So the, but, um, but what does that have to do with Yitzhak going to his well, mother's funeral? Did, did he actually, like Pinchas, actually, you know, uh, left the world because of fear from, from the tribe of Shalom? <laughs> So did 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 Yitzhak really you know maybe leave the world for a few for for a couple of days and go up to Shemaya? How do you know Yitzhak didn't go to his mother's funeral? How do you know that? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't say it anywhere. That doesn't mean anything. <coughs> Torah doesn't say a lot of things. So I'm just wondering where do you get this? So then but we assume we assume that he did go to his mother's funeral. Sorrow. Yeah, I mean I understand why why you making that assumption. You might have an answer. <laughs> but I, I disagree with the whole p question. Uh, he did go to his mother's funeral. Unless you show me a magic where it says he didn't. Yeah. Then we can think about that. But uh, you, you, as far as I know, he went to Sora's funeral. Yeah. You know? Oh, okay. Sure. I'll take your word for it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? It does say Yusuf came together, came back, but does it say both of them would come back from the Akkad? It says only Abram came back. We don't, but there's no proof that he didn't go to his mother's funeral. There is something, there is something Unless you bring me a medrash or something I like that. I think there's a medrash, I have to check it, that, that he went up, he was taken to Ghanai in, in that time. Thank you. Till, till, till he came to uh, you mean, the and, Because you see, the Torah doesn't mention anything. Yeah, but that in but itself is not a riot, unless the medrash says. What? That is not a riot unless the medrash openly I says that. that. I show you a check. No, but he seen the pasuk that the Yitzchak is not mentioned. He doesn't come back. Yeah, so it could, look the main uh, character in the story is. Yeah, okay. I, I hear the question. I, I I don't have an answer for right then right now. I don't know. I have to see if the whole thing is true. You know? Yeah, I, I heard this when I was a teenager. So, but I don't. That's why. It's a long time ago. <laughs> Looking at your white beard, that's a long time ago. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of countries that uh, deserve payback for what they did to us. So we think, will they all get what they're coming to? Everybody will get exactly what they... The only thing is the Rebbe takes his time, because maybe he wants the country to try to do tshuva, or he's... The Rebbe has an exact accounting of every single not just country, individual. Nobody walks away, uh, you know, scot-free. Doesn't happen. Everybody has their accounting, a file cabinet in heaven that's got everybody who ever lived. And what happens to them is exact. That's justice, that's denim, you know? So that includes people, that includes families, includes nations, includes everything. You see? Yeah. Is it known the criteria? What? Of, is it known the criteria of the Mashiach comes who's going to be be saved and who's going to be wiped out? Yes, it's part of the Cheshbon, right? Who is who is worthy of being saved and experiencing the messianic redemption, right? So Hashem knows and Mashiach would know. Well, Mashiach will know because he'll be he, he will see it. He will experience, you know. And will it be miraculous like when the angel of death came and people just died overnight? Will it be similar to that? Will what be similar to that? People who will not survive to be able to see Mashiach, <coughs> times of Mashiach. Yeah, so well, what's the question? People will just die suddenly like that. Like will there be darkness and there will be darkness? Oh, no, 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 they'll, they'll just die. I mean, however... Yeah. Like a natural death. Right, right, right. Which is what's happening now with COVID. Mm -hmm. And in general, people die of heart attacks and all kinds of stuff, you know. Yeah. Okay, okay wow. Uh, let me ask you a question getting back to Trump. Trump. Um, you you uh, think that um, he'll be able to overcome the voter fraud this time around? <clears throat> oh. That would, that would be the miracle. Yes. It's not just him. The Republican Party has to do that. <clears throat> you know, he can make all the claims he wants, but 
The Republican Party will do that. They will be very careful, at least as much as they can. Look, the House is now in the hands of the Republicans, which you should know is a chesed of the Rebbeinu He didn't give it all to the progressives, you know. He gave it to the uh, Republicans, you know, the conservatives, to stop the madness of the Democratic Party in the Senate, you know. America's at war. We, you can't believe the division of America. You know, um, I want to tell you some countries went to civil war less than what is going on in America. America's a very divided country. In fact, I'll tell you something interesting. The Republicans thought that they would have a major landslide, right? right? What happened? What happened? They won the Senate, and they have, what, a couple of guys in the House? It's nothing. Why? How are they so all off? You know why? You want the real reason why? Because America, and that's why I'm saying it, America is a very divided country in many ways. Not only in ideology, but they're divided in terms of the economic level. Half the country cannot make it and make a living. They are, for them, they must have handouts by the government. That's how they survive. They need handouts, right? That's <coughs> called entitlements. The other half can live on their own. You see? Uh, so what they did is they underestimated the amount of people that need handouts. For those people, it's 50% of the country, for those people who need that, they don't care if the Democratic Party are crazy. They need the handouts. They're known as the handout party. You know what I'm saying? And in fact, that's what Biden was doing, giving money to guys because of COVID. So they couldn't care less if the Democratic Party is uh, whatever, is doing bad stuff and inflation. They need the handout more than the inflation. They don't care. You see, the other half says well, this is ridiculous. And they, um, it's interesting that they failed to take that in account when they were trying to predict that the Republicans would win. That's why they didn't, they won in the House. They're lucky they were just able to because America has, is tremendously divided in terms of the economic situation of the different Americans and also the ideology, you see? And therefore, America really, in a certain sense, is at the cusp of civil war. But I don't think, it won't be military, but it clearly could be ideological, you know? Do you see a Trump-DeSantis ticket as a possibility? I, you know, I, I, I've thought about that, but I don't know, if, see, the problem with DeSantis, he's a very independent guy, and the VP is basically a nobody. I mean, unless, unless the president offers him the chance to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, I, I tell you, whatever DeSantis does, DeSantis, he's gonna weigh his chances of becoming the next president. Mm -hmm. He's got that in mind. The question if he understands that now is not the time, but he clearly will be the Republican uh, nomination after Trump, whatever that is, right? So whatever he does, that's the major consideration, you see? So if he feels being governor of Florida is a better chance, because then he's independent, he can do whatever he wants, he'll remain. If he feels being the VP, right? And he'll also be doing a lot of stuff. Trump would use him just like he used Pence, right? Then he'll do that. So it all depends what DeSantis sees as the better stepping stone to becoming president. You know, and that, that's what these guys are gonna decide on, saying? But it would be a very interesting ticket. It certainly would be, you know? Okay, so we'll uh, dive in Mario in uh, three minutes.